and I'm the chair of the uh, risk limiting audit working group. Um, <clears throat> um, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is a fascinating topic to me, um, and it's critically important to maintaining uh, voters' faith in the electoral process, uh, and it's important to Secretary Merrill as well. Um, <clears throat> Connecticut is uh, a bit ahead of the curve. Um, there's not every state has an audit procedure now. Um, and we use paper ballots, uh, voter marked paper ballots that make the auditing process possible. Uh, <clears throat> and we've been doing it for uh, more than a decade since we first introduced the, the paper ballots. Um, but we're always looking to improve and um, there's a there's definitely a national trend toward risk limiting audits and I you know I, I I'm going to leave most of the talk about the actual audits for for later for for Alex Russell um, but this is a it's potentially a more efficient and more effective way of auditing elections so um, I'm excited to work with all of you to study it and then um, do a pilot program this fall and see where we can go from there. Um, I'm, I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, the members of the committee. Um, uh, uh, the appointment from the Speaker of the House uh, is Giselle Feliciano. Um, uh, the appointment from the Minority Leader is Robert Hamm. The appointment from the, the House, the House Minority Leader. The appointment from the Senate Minority Leader is uh, Louis DeCilio, who's the Registrar of Voters in Stratford. Um, the appointment by the ranking members of the GAE Committee, uh, Dominic Rapini. Uh, the Secretary of the State's appointment, uh, one uh, must be a Connecticut attorney with expertise expertise in election law, and one must be a statistician. Uh, attorney Aida Carini, who's a staff attorney in our office, um, and Brian McDonald, who's a lecturer in statistics and data science at Yale. Uh, Lois Timms Ferreira, appointed by Rovac, is the Registrar of Voters in Ellington. Um, Tim Beeble, uh, also appointed by Rovac, Registrar of Voters in Bethel. Uh, and Alex Russell, director of the Center for Voting Technology Research at UConn, also known as the UConn Voter Center. Um, and uh, the next thing on our agenda, I'm going to introduce Alex Russell uh, and Ben Fuller, who is his colleague at the UConn Voter Center, who have a presentation on uh, risk limiting audits. Uh, that'll, that'll hopefully be a nice introduction to it for us, for us non-math people as well. Great. Should I just go ahead and pick up here, Gabe? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, so again, I'm Alex Russell. I'm absolutely delighted, uh, delighted to be here. Um, uh, almost accidentally over the last couple of months, um, uh, Ben Fuller and I um, have spent quite a bit of time looking into the literature on risk limiting audits and um, also informing ourselves with um, with, with previous attempts to deploy risk limiting audits and previous uh, pilot programs. Um, I put together a little slide deck today. I wasn't 100% sure what the audience was. So um, I know there are experts here um, about risk limiting audits. And so if I'm saying things that you already know, forgive me. Um, likewise, uh, if I say things that seem needlessly jargon intensive or confusing, since um, there's a small number of people in the meeting, just please go ahead and don't be shy, just interrupt me and, um, uh, and give me a chance to, to try to clarify things. Um, okay, so let me see if I can share. Oh dear, right. Yes, of course, uh, my Mac here is extremely concerned about the security of sharing my screen with you. So give me one moment while I tell it that you're all trusted friends. Ah, and now I'm gonna have to reopen Zoom. Forgive me, everybody, talk amongst yourselves. I'll be back in 30 seconds. Well, that's the... Uh... That's the, 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 the blessing of Zoom is that we're able to have these meetings safely, you know, despite a pandemic. Uh, and the drawback is that we can't actually have them sometimes because of technical difficulties. But uh, it is, 
um, uh, we'll be back online shortly and and um, we'll we'll take a look at that presentation. You, you know what else, Kate? It's, uh, it, yeah. it's also a reminder that uh, when it comes to uh, any type of technology in elections, that technology can be both a blessing and a curse. <laughs> So. Sure. Well, I, there's certainly a reason why we uh, why we use uh, hand marked uh, paper ballots. Exactly. Alex, okay, we so can see you. Yep. Hopefully you can all see that slide now. We're on the same page. Okay, beautiful. Um, so let me um, uh, pick things up and move right along here. So, um, so a risk limiting audit um, has the goal of verifying the outcome of an election by re-examining cast ballots. Uh, just to reiterate on something that Gabe already said, that uh, in order for this to even be possible, you have to have a voter verified paper trail. And it's, um, it's by you know, re-examining that paper trail that, um, that a risk limiting audit proceeds. So, um, so ideally, the process should detect tabulation failures that would have actually affected the outcome of the election. Um, Furthermore, the goal is for the process to be efficient. And by that, I mean, it shouldn't take uh, too much extra overhead or resources to, um, to carry out the audit. Um, uh, another goal is that the process should be transparent. And by that, I mean that an external observer of the process should be able to have confidence in, in the outcome of the audit. Um, so with those, you know, three ideal goals behind us, let me say a couple of things about what a typical risk limiting audit looks like. So typically the process is randomized. And uh, by that, I mean, it typically involves um, looking at a random sample of the ballots that were used in the election. And for this reason, um, uh, a typical risk limiting audit has some risk. And when I say risk, um, I mean something you know really specific here. I mean that there's going to be some chance that um, that a bad election, and what I really mean when I say a bad election is um, an election where the tabulated totals dis you know disagree with the uh, with what appears on the ballots, and in fact disagree uh, to an extent that actually would overturn one of the results of the election. So risk means that there will be a chance that a, that a bad election is not, not detected by an audit. And the whole area of risk limiting audits um, is focused on this, this one goal, which is to design and implement an auditing process that controls that risk. And when I say controls, I mean, you know, you give an, like an explicit bound on the probability that this terrible thing happens, that there was a bad election, but we don't catch it in the audit. Uh, and, and typically, the process is also hardware independent. And when I say that, I mean that this bound on risk shouldn't, shouldn't involve any trust, for example, in the tabulators that were used for the election. Um, ideally, it should also not even involve any trust in electronic infrastructure that was actually used for the, uh, for the audit itself. Um, so I, I said this, but it's so important. Let me be, let me say it again. Uh, so, what does risk limited mean? What does risk limited mean? Um, so, the goal here is an explicit bound on this risk. And what are we really talking about? Well, so the first question to answer is um, is, is what is the truth? That is, you know, what do we mean when we talk about the outcome of the election? And the intuition of this is clear. It's you know, it's what the ballots it's what the ballots reveal. And more operationally, what we typically mean by that phrase is what a hand count of the ballots um, would reveal for the election. Um, you know, I, I want to sort of say at the, at the out at the out at the outset that um, a hand count itself is a somewhat noisy and imperfect thing. So, defining the outcome of an election by a hand count 
is already a slightly slippery uh, concept, but but that's the sort of standard in this area, which is we define the outcome as what a hand count would would reveal. Um, okay, so to precisely define what risk limited means, there are sort of two steps to this. Um, the first is that we define exactly what the audit is. And so that means we have some specific procedure that we're using for choosing the, the ballots that we inspect. Uh, we have some specific procedure that we agree upon for what the inspection of the ballots um, uh, involves and how that gives the conclusion of the audit. And then ultimately the rules of the game are that the audit either concludes with the phrase, the result of the election look correct, or it concludes with the phrase, the results appear incorrect. And typically when people talk about risk limiting audits, in the second case, when the conclusion of the audit is the results appear incorrect, that means we're just gonna do a hand recount now. Um, and then the next step, once you have all of the like operational details of the audit you know, fixed and, and um, agreed upon, the next step is that you prove um, typically two things. The first is the really critical thing. And the second is something that would just be nice to have. So the first thing you prove is that if the tabulated results uh, disagree with the truth, that is you know, the, the outcome of the election that would um, appear if you did a hand count, then the probability that the audit actually would, would tell you that it was correct is some known fixed small value. And that known fixed small value is the risk. Um, in a lot of uh, uh, historical pilots, people have set this risk limit at 10% or 5%. Um, but when people talk about you know, the risk or the risk limit for an audit, this is the quantity that they, that they mean. That is the probability that the audit, when it's all said and, said and done, declares the, um, uh, that the results look correct, even when they were wrong. So uh, there's, a, there's a dual side of all of this that we would like, which is that if it turns out that um, the tabulated results agree with the real results, well, it would be nice if the audit would conclude that with high probability. So, um, so the reason that these two statements are sort of on, on unequal footing is that um, uh, perhaps it's obvious, but, but let me say it again, is that if it turns out that the results of the election agree with the truth and um, the audit kind of messes up and it says, oh, I don't know, you know, the results appear incorrect and we go and we do a complete hand count of the election, then we wasted a lot of time, but um, there was no other harm done, right? The flip side, that is the possibility that the tabulated results disagree with the truth, but the audit said that everything was fine. This is the catastrophic failure that we really wanna make sure that we, um, that we prevent. So that's why these two um, desirable goals that I'm talking about here are on different footing, right? One is kind of a must have, and the other is something that would be nice to have. Okay, so with all that definitional business behind us, um, there are, and maybe I should stop, you know, I, I said at the beginning, please go ahead and interrupt me with questions. But of course, while I'm rattling away here, it's um, maybe, you know, hard to get a word in edgewise. So um, are there some questions or something worth discussing on those first couple of definitional slides? Yeah. Alex, Donald Grappini here. Um, and just, so, just so I can get straight with the nomenclature, when you say, for example, we assign a value of 5% um, of uh, disagreement or error, are we saying that if, we're, if we, we go through a, an audit and we find out there's a 5% error rate um, and that agrees with the hand count, or then we're okay? Is, are we saying 5% error is acceptable or is that just a threshold for, for looking at another proof? Perfect. Yes. I mean, um, this is exactly the this is exactly the right thing to really hone in on. So unfortunately, um, in this business of auditing, there are all of these different error rates that get mixed into this big like this big cauldron of discussion and teasing them apart is um, one of the major challenges. So um, so the error rate that I'm talking about here, you know, the risk. Um, 
refers to the following the, the following um, uh, error. So, uh, so the election happens. Um, there are tabulated results for the election, and there are, of course, the real results for the election. Unfortunately, we don't know the, the real results, typically, because we haven't done a, a hand count. So all we have are the tabulated results. And then this risk limit or um, error that I'm talking about is, um, is the following thing. So we're going to choose a whole bunch of random ballots to look at um, uh, typically by choosing uniform ballots, but there are other more sophisticated ways that one can use to choose random ballots to look at. And then after having looked at those random ballots, we're going to make this determination, either things look good or things look bad. And this, this error rate is the probability that um, after making all these random selections of these various ballots and looking at them, that, um, that we get the wrong answer. And, and it's getting the wrong answer uh, just in this particular setting. We really only care about the setting for risk where the, the election was wrong, but we said it was right. And so it's the probability that that happens. So you can think of, you know, suppose the election was, was wrong, what's the probability? Um, and that probability is taken over our random choice of these ballots that we mess up and we say that it was correct. And and as you and as you as you pointed out in your question, um, that is um, related but different from this question of, for example, like what was the margin of victory in the election, or um, uh, or how does the margin of victory in the election compare with the margin of victory that we observed in the random ballot? So there are all these other error rates kicking around, but mm -hmm. for the moment, this notion of risk is that like particular one. Okay. So, did I, did I kind of like close in on, on the answer here? Well, it's good. To, I think it's going to have, for me personally, it's going to take, I am, I'm going to have to keep staring at these definitions for a while and, and, and uh, I don't think I'll slowly absorb them. It's a little abstract. Absolutely. Um, but it's but it's not unattainable. It's just uh, we got to keep staring at it. So I appreciate you going through this. Alex, and, and I, Alex, Bob, Bob Ham here with a question, please. Hey, Bob, please go ahead. Yes, sir. The uh, and I'm sure that this was just almost an offhand comment on your part. But you mentioned that you in the audit you would choose uh, the word you use or a whole bunch of random ballots. And could you confirm that that would be a statistically valid number of ballots that you would be choosing for the audit to be of term? Exactly. So um, um, that is exactly the right question to ask at this point. And um, to uh, uh, to answer it, let me just show you the last slide in the talk without saying anything. Uh, so about I got it. Hey, I apologize. No, no, no problem. The last slide looks something like this. So you can see, you know, tables of risks and how many ballots are getting selected, and absolutely, your question of um, how many ballots have to be selected and and um, and how are they selected and how are they analyzed? Um, that's exactly one of the questions that these various auditing procedures um, are tasked to answer. Um, okay, so. So unless there are other questions, and I actually, I can't see every one of you in my frame. So if you're holding up your hand or something, forgive me for not encouraging you. Just go ahead and interrupt me and, and ask your question. Oh, ben, you, you wanted to say me? something. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to say that um, modern techniques, there's this risk limit. So Alex said 5%. Um, modern techniques will actually, based on the ballots that you've looked at, will tell you an observed risk. So they will tell you, for example, here's how, how much these ballots are disagreed with the tabulated results. And it's, it actually is possible, for example, to set a 5% risk limit. And actually, once you run the audit, say, actually, there was only a 1% chance that there was a problem. So um, it is possible to kind of tune these things in a little bit and... Um, Maybe I, I guess the thing is to to run an audit and decide if you're comfortable with the observed risk after running the audit. Presumably, all of these, like the the risk limit as well as the maximum observable risk, would eventually be put in statute, um, but they don't necessarily have to be the same. Great. Um, so. I 
So um, all the definitional business that I was just uh, talking about, um, um, I, I think can kind of be put in context and maybe um, understood a little more easily with some specific examples on the table. So let me transition now to talk about, you know, the three uh, standard approaches to risk limiting to risk limiting audits. So uh, the first is definitely the easiest to describe, and that is a complete handcap. So um, you, uh, after understanding that when we define what we mean by the outcome of election to be the result of a hand count, one way to audit the election is just to carry out a complete hand count. Um, this has some nice advantages, which is that it has zero risk. Um, and there are actually some other nice advantages, uh, which is that a complete hand count also provides an extremely pre precise view of the election results. And, and when I say that, I mean, if you have a complete hand count, you can also, uh, for example, um, detect localized failures of tabulators in particular precincts, um, which, you know, which clearly uh, has some benefits beyond just uh, auditing the outcome of the election. Well, I don't need to dwell on the downside of a complete hand count, which is that it's expensive and, and slow. So the second common procedure for a risk limiting audit is called ballot polling. Um, and ballot polling works like this. Um, you're going to pick a number uh, N, and I'll, I'll talk in a minute about how that number is selected. And you draw N random ballots from across the straight, from across the state. Um, and I really should have emphasized here that what you want to do is draw N ballots sort of uniformly um, from across the state, so that you know each ballot, each time you draw, has um, the same chance as each other ballot um, of being selected. So you draw, you know, N ballots across the state. You have a look at what you saw on those ballots. And if the winners that are shown on this subset of ballots agrees with the tabulated winner, then you say, hey, everything looks good. And if not, you say, gee, this is suspicious, and you do a full recount. Um, as, as Ben pointed out in a comment on these slides, um, the reality here is just it's a little bit more sophisticated. Um, um, of course, when you look at the tabulated totals for the state, um, there will be some margin of victory between you know, the winner and, and the runner up. And typically what you do in ballot polling is, um, is, is ensure that what you're seeing is consistent with that margin of victory. But in any case, this um, sort of simple view, I think, is, is, is fine for getting a picture of what's happening. So there are two natural questions to ask here. Uh, the first is, how do you draw a random ballot? And the second is, how big does that need to be? Um, so the pros are, this is a pretty simple, I mean, once you, you know, answer those two questions, this is a pretty simple procedure. And, and it turns out that if you run the mathematics, which tells you how big N needs to be for, um, for a particular margin, then it turns out that this works, this works well if you, have, um, if you have large margins. And I'll return to that point in just a moment. The cons are, it turns out that when the margins are small, one to 2%, then to get small risk, uh, this technique requires that you draw and examine a lot of ballots. Um, so it could be many thousands and, and um, I'll give some examples on the, on the last page. Alex, can I say something here? Please. Sorry, this is Ben Fuller again from the Voter Center. Um, even this procedure, which seems pretty simple, can be complicated. So what I mean by that is, let's suppose there, there's a, a group of auditors at the state house that say, we want these thousand random ballots. There's now the question of how you tell all of the municipalities which ballots they're supposed to be getting and how all of those municipalities report back results in a way that is, is not compromising um, the ballots themselves 
and is preserving all of the, the rights and expectations of voters. Um, so just this communication process of please tell me the result on this ballot and reporting all of this is something that requires a bit of care and can be a complicated procedure to manage. Um, okay, uh, great. Thanks. Thanks for being the wet blanket here, Beth. Much appreciated. Um, um, okay, so there were two challenges that I identified on the previous slide. And uh, the first is that the, the mathematical analysis of, um, of ballot polling typically requires this notion of uniformly sampling a ballot, which means there are all these ballots out there in the state and you wanna make sure that you are selecting a ballot in such a way that each one has the same chance of getting selected. So let's say uniformly selecting a ballot. And um, it's not a surprise, but it's, it's good to say out loud that in a typical distributed situation like in Connecticut, where at the end of our election, you know, we've got ballots and precincts tucked, um, uh, tucked away all over the state. Um, one very important piece of information that we need in order to, to uniformly select a ballot is how many ballots there are in each precinct. Um, and since we may not trust the tabulated results, after all, you know, the whole name of the game here is to double check the veracity of the tabulated results. Since we don't trust the tabulated results, a, a ballot polling audit requires what's called a ballot manifest. And this is um, a hand count of the number of ballots that appears in each, uh, say, district in the state. That is then used um, at the statewide level to uniformly select to uniformly select the ballots that are going to be used in the in the audit. Basically, um, uh, a precinct that has twice as many ballots is going to be selected twice as often to you know draw one of their ballots for this random selection process. And in that way, we're selecting each ballot in the state with the same uh, same probability. Uh, so the second the second question. Um, which, uh, which, which was brought up earlier in the call is how big does N need to be? That is, how do you, how do you know how many ballots to pick so that you can be confident at the end of the day that, um, uh, that you're given the right answer that, you know, specifically that you're controlling risk. And there's a kind of nice fact here, which is that this number N, that is how many ballots are you going to select and look at? Uh, can be uh, determined by the tabulated margin. And, and um, I think that's a slightly sort of interesting and surprising fact that it's outset. So let me dwell on it for just, just a moment. Um, again, we don't trust, you know, we're in a situation where we're trying to double check the, the tabulated totals. And so trusting those tabulated totals for anything in our audit may seem like um, a suspicious or, un, or um, unwarranted thing to do. Um, but, it, but yet it turns out that in a ballot polling audit, it, it, you can select this number N of how many ballots you're going to examine based on the margin of victory for, let's say the candidate whose race we're, we're auditing here, uh, given by the tabulated totals. And, and the reason for this is that we're trying to decide whether or not the tabulated totals are correct or not, right? So if the tabulated total totals are telling us that, um, you know, this particular candidate won this election by a landslide, then it, um, it sort of agrees with your intuition that we should be able to, to check that that um, we should be able to check that fact without drawing too many without drawing too many uh, ballots. That is, if the tabulated total says that this candidate won the election by a landslide, but in fact um, that candidate lost the election, then only a, then by examining a small number of ballots, we will should see results that are inconsistent with a landslide victory as determined by the, the tabulated total. So um, the conclusion of maybe that somewhat confusing example is just that you can use the tabulated margin to tell you how big N needs to be. And, and returning to something on the previous slide, 
it turns out that that if the tabulated margin is large, then ballot polling can be pretty efficient. You can get by with not looking at too many ballots and I'll have some specific numbers on the last page. Um, uh, the flip side is that when the margin is very small, one or 2%, then ballot polling requires that you draw and examine um, a large number, you know, many thousands of, many thousands of ballots. So it's that weakness of ballot polling, that is the fact that when the margins get small, you have to examine a lot of ballots that motivates uh, the last procedure that I, I'll talk about here, which is called ballot comparison. Um, it's a little more complicated because it involves uh, like one more entity in the mix. And that new entity is something called a cast vote record. So the way you run a ballot comparison audit um, is you first generate a cast vote record for each voting district. And a cast vote record is uh, nothing more than a list of all of the ballots in that district um, with a declaration of, of which votes appeared on that, on that ballot. And in principle, you could imagine a, you know, a standard issue voting tabulator um, uh, you can imagine that it would generate such a cast vote record for you. Um, oddly, uh, oddly, there are not in there. Oddly, there are not available currently um, tabulators designed for for small districts that that do this. Um, so, in our situation here in Connecticut, we would be looking at generating these cast vote records using a, a, a different tool. But for the moment, let me put aside the issue of how you generate the cast vote record and just say step one, generate this cast vote record. And let me say it again, that's nothing more than a list um, for every district of all the ballots that appeared in the district and the votes that appeared on those ballots. Um, once you have those cast vote records, uh, you're going to carry out two checks with the cast vote records. Uh, the first is you check that, you know, the totals given by these cast vote records, which I will call CVRs, agree with the tabulated totals. And then the second check is this uh, statistical check. That is, you'll draw a bunch of uh, ballots, either uniformly or using some more exotic um, method, and you then check that the actual physical ballot agrees with what you see on the on the cast vote record. Um, I want to emphasize that in this situation, you know, again, we're we're trying to double check the veracity of the original tabulated results. And uh, what we have done is introduce this new sort of uh, even richer object, which is a cast vote record. And I want to emphasize that we don't necessarily trust that the cast vote records that we generate are correct. That is, we put them in the same suspicious category that we put the original tabulated results in. So you can, um, you can imagine that we've got the tabulated results, we've got these CVRs, and now given all of that information, we're going to carry out a statistical uh, test that involves both the original tabulated results and the CVRs. And again, when we evaluate the, the risk, we're not going to assume that the original tabulated results are correct or that the cast vote records are correct. Um, so to say it again, we start with the tabulated results, we somehow or other um, build CVRs, and then we carry out these two kinds of like transitive checks, right? The first check is that the CVRs agree with the tabulated results, that is they get the same totals or, or nearby totals. And then the second check is to sort of check the correctness of the CVRs, and that is done by drawing ballots, typically uniformly and, and comparing what's on the ballot with what was declared for that ballot on the on the CVR, and uh, yes, please. Yeah, hey, Alex, thank you. Listen, in the beginning of this segment, you talked about three techniques, and I feel like we're on our fourth technique right now. Is is oh. a ballot comparison a technique or or just a cross check for the first three? Uh, no, it's I, I would consider it a different technique. So the three techniques that I had in mind are a full recount, right? Uh, ballot polling where you just draw ballots, sum the results that you get and see how it compares with what you had. And then finally, this more sophisticated uh, ballot comparison thing. 
So, so what was uni uniform selection? Ah, oh, great. Um, so uniform selection is a part of the rules for ballot polling. That is, you know, ballot polling says, okay, guys, we're going to go out there and we're going to draw, we're going to look at a bunch of random ballots. And then this uniform selection thing is what the word random means here. So, so when we say we're going to look at a bunch of random ballots, more specifically, what is typically meant by ballot polling is we want to make sure that each time we draw a ballot for, um, uh, for that audit, that we're doing it in a way so that every ballot in the state has the same probability of being selected. Got it. Okay, so that was just a, that was just a, you're just expanding on the on the uh, the how um, one of the elements of these three techniques. Exactly. So so part of the uh, typical instructions for ballot polling are okay. End times do this following little procedure, and this little okay. procedure is supposed to select a ballot uniformly among all ballots in the state. All right. Thank you. Okay, Alex, I, I have yes, a question. Lou Bucilio from Stratford. Hey, Lou. Um, this whole random selection of ballots, I'm, you know, I've, I've been a registrar for 17 years and I know how these ballots are stored. And you talk about a random selection of these ballots, like how, how would you randomly select a bunch of ballots that are in a ballot bag stored in, in you know, in, a, in either in a bag or a compartment where, you know, you, you may be doing a, you know, either it's a, whether it's a governor's race or a congressional race where you have each municipality with their own set of ballots in for their own districts. How do you randomly select out of those? Great, okay, that's an awesome question. Um, so there are, there are um, more or less uh, two answers to that, to that question that I'm aware of. Um, and actually before I answer that question, um, let me say that in this third procedure that I'm talking about here, ballot comparison, um, notice that there's something that I've kind of swept under the rug so far in my description to you. And that is that, that, that notice that this, this CVR, you know, is supposed to have a list of, you know, all of the ballots in there and what's on those ballots. But if that's going to be any use to us, we need to have a way to associate a particular line of the cast vote record with like a particular physical ballot, which, as you said, may be buried in like some bag. Um, so, so in order for this ballot comparison audit to, to really work, you need to have a way to identify a particular ballot. And um, in particular, that typically means you either have serial numbers on the ballots, um, or in principle, it's possible to do this by trying to use the physical position of the ballot in the room to keep track of it. You can imagine how well that goes. Anyway, so, uh, so one answer to your question is you can imagine that, um, I mean, you could imagine a situation where ballots themselves actually have pre-printed serial numbers on them. And, you know, we know for a particular precinct, which serial numbers, you know, went through their tabulator, and then you could actually use the serial number to select a ballot. Now, um, there are many reasons not to like that. Um, in particular, having serial numbers on ballots um, bef you know, before they're tabulated opens up a very tricky privacy can of worms, right? And, and even if you could arrange it so that, even if you could arrange it using like sophisticated cryptography or other things so that those serial numbers were kind of hard for humans to interpret, like even if it doesn't actually deliver a huge privacy risk, it delivers the perception of a privacy risk, right? I, you know, I think it's an uncomfortable thing to tell a voter, here's your ballot. It does have a unique serial number on it, but trust me, you know, I, I'm not going to use that serial number to, you know, associate you with a vote afterwards. So, um, so, uh, so anyway, that's one way to identify particular ballots or randomly select them, which is to have identifying marks on them. Um, another way is that there are some sort of nice methods out there. Um, there's a method called this K-cut method that is a way to take a bunch of ballots that are in a room, and it's a little bit like cutting a deck of cards over and over again. So you generate a bunch of random numbers, and you take the ballots in a stack, and you flip like the top over the bottom after going so far down the stack. And this is a technique to try to take, to try to draw a random ballot from a bunch of ballots in a room. But your question is a good one, which is that in general, it's not so obvious how to do this. 
And, and Alex, just to add yes. on that, so yeah. the the states that have done statewide risk limiting audits, generally it means one of the things that they do first is they have to overhaul their ballot storage a little bit. So um, what we've seen recommended in a lot of places, if, for example, you're going to do ballot comparison, is you, you keep your ballots in stacks of 50 instead of stacks of 2,000 so that this process is easier. That means more boxes. It may mean more space. It means you have to have a better accounting of where all your ballots are. Um, so like this is this is something that people do in stages, right? Like you don't just say like, we're gonna do a risk limit and got it. You have to put infrastructure for ballot storage in place first and, and reporting all of that ballot storage so that you can, you can do this ballot selection properly. Um, anyway, so the short answer to your question is there are sort of two techniques here. One is to have a way to individually identify ballots. And the second is to take um, a big stack of ballots and to use um, a technique that allows you to draw one randomly, kind of like cutting a deck of cards over and over again. Um, so uh, your question kind of forced this issue that I was actually going to put off until the next, uh, until the next or maybe the last slide, but let me, let me say it now. Um, one of the things that I'm personally hoping that we uh, can pilot this year in Connecticut is some kind of ballot comparison audit. And that requires that we have some unique identifying marks on, on ballots. Um, there are many reasons, of course, this is something that we can discuss in the committee. I, I think there are many reasons not to want to have unique identifying marks on ballots prior to use to voters marking them. Um, so one possibility that we've been talking about at the voter lab is having a QR sticker stuck onto a ballot after the fact. So at the time that a ballot manifest is being made and you know, the, the number of ballots is being settled once and for all, um, you know, a QR sticker could be stuck on the back of all the ballots and that could be used uh, in the ballot comparison audit as a mechanism for unambiguously identifying a particular ballot. Um, anyway, let me, let me back out of that and um, just say a little bit more about ballot comparison and how it works. And then maybe we can return to some of these uh, details uh, later today or in our next meeting. Um, right, so ballot comparison, uh, you generate the CVRs, you check that the CVR totals are very close to the tabulator totals, you then select, um, uh, you select some number N of random ballots, you compare those um, ballots against the declarations for those ballots that appear in the CVR. If there are very few discrepancies, you say, yep, things look good. Uh, if you see more, if you see too many discrepancies, then you say, I'm suspicious of this, I wanna do a full recount. So, um, so the pros of ballot comparison and indeed one of the original motivations for um, studying, for proposing ballot comparison at all is that the number of ballots that you need to, to draw and analyze in ballot comparison is smaller than for ballot polling. Um, and in particular, ballot comparison can give reasonable numbers of ballots that you're forced to examine even when margins are quite small. And I know I keep using these weasel words like large and small and quite. Um, and on the last slide, I'll give you some specific numbers just so you have a sense for what, you know, for, for what these things look like. Um, and another, another pro is that, you know, CVRs do give a, can give a quite precise view of what happened in a particular, um, you know, voting district, and so they can help to identify local tabulator idiosyncrasies or problems. Okay, so what are the downsides of ballot comparison? Well, um, there's this new, there's this, you know, new element in the mix here, right, which these CVR, so those things have to be, uh, have to be generated somehow, that's more work. Um, and it's also just a more complicated, it's also just an inherently more complicated procedure than ballot polling. You know, now you're drawing a ballot and you're comparing it with this declared line on a CVR. So a little more, a little more complex. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I guess I should mention here that while the tabulators that we have in Connecticut do not produce CBRs, um, uh, the auditing the auditing machinery that we have used in Connecticut for the last um, uh, five or six years can produce CBRs using off-the-shelf equipment. So, in principle, we do, we do have a way do have a way to do that. Okay, so I, I feel like I'm burning up too much time of our meeting here. So um, uh, let me try to close things out. Um, so what are the, the challenges for a ballot comparison? Well, I already mentioned this, you have to produce, you have to produce CBRs. Um, you need to have a way to uniquely identify ballots. So this typically means serial numbers or some identifying mark uh, placed, um, you know, after votes were cast. And then in order to um, in order to give external observers confidence in the outcome of a ballot comparison audit, they really need to be able to compare the selected ballots against against the CVR. So this means that uh, more or less um, for a ballot comparison audit to really be providing the kind of transparency that we might like, we have to release the CVRs um, uh, either publicly or to the people in the room during the audit so that individuals have a way to see the ballot that was selected and compare with their line on their CVR that it was correct. And, um, and, and as you might guess, you know, there are some uh, delicacies here. In particular, we're exposing more information about the election than just the tabulated results, and that's something that, that one should one should be aware of and, and discuss. Uh, okay, so um, finally, just some pictures of what of what you know what these numbers n are. Uh, so there are two columns here: one for ballot polling and one for ballot comparison. Remember, ballot polling is you select a bunch of ballots, you look at them, you count up the results, and you sort of see statistically how they compare with the results that that, that were tabulated. Ballot comparison is a slightly fancier thing. The CVRs are generated, you select N ballots and you compare the ballots against the CVR. So um, the, there's a, uh, a sort of axis here for margin. That is, um, you know, what the margin was between the, the tabulated winner of the election and the runner up. Um, and then there are two columns, one for polling and one for comparison. And under each of those two sort of meta columns, it's broken down into two sub columns. You know, one is if you want 5% risk and, and, you know, remember 5% risk means that if you did this, if you did this kind of audit 20 times, one of those times, even if the election was wrong, you wouldn't detect it, right? And a 1% risk means that if you did this for a hundred years, um, and you know every and and the results were wrong every year. You would catch it in 99 of those years, um, and you can see what these numbers look like. So you know you can see that when that with margins of oh I don't know five or ten percent, the number of ballots that you have to examine with with ballot polling is under some kind of reasonable control. I mean between sort of one and three thousand ballots. Um, and you can also observe that as the margins get tighter, um, you know, you can look at the lines for one, two, and three percent, the number of ballots that a ballot polling audit will insist upon will typically be very high, you know, in the in the in the thousands or, or tens of thousands. Um, so sort of qualitatively, uh, qualitatively you can see that ballot comparison where you're comparing the ballots against the CVRs, in general, require many, many fewer ballots to be examined. Um, yeah, sorry, I saw you had a question. I didn't mean to cut you Alex, off. Alex, could you walk us through a, what a real life example? Just let's just take the one percent margin, and just walk us through what that means left to right. In terms, you know, um, so one percent margin is a legislative race. It's very tight, and if we're using a five percent risk uh, variable, that that means there's uh, we had we have to go through sixty one thousand votes to be able to uh, get some validity on the data. Right? That's right. Exactly. One percent means we ninety one thousand eight hundred. 
Exactly. Okay. So you got it. So, um, you know, with 1%, with a 1% margin. So, you know, uh, we have a very tight race. Uh, candidate A is 1% ahead of candidate B. If we decide that we don't want to make an error, except for 5% of the time, we don't mind making an error 5% of the time in our final determination here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then uh, with ballot polling, we would have to, to 61,000 times draw a random ballot and, you know, look at the votes on that, on that ballot. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I should say that in typical pilots, you know, in these situations, they don't do this, right? So, so once you, once you get to numbers that are this big, I think often a state will decide that we're just going to, it's, it's easier to recount the election. Oh, right. Right. And right. then so, ballot, ballot comparison, which requires us the generation of a CDR is far more, far less labor intensive, but our machines probably are not capable of this generating what we need to do it. Right. So that's exactly that, right. That technique. Okay. No, that's exactly right. Thank you. So just just to go on what Alex said, so so Georgia ran a risk limiting audit for the presidential election last year, and their reported margin was what 0.2 percent, I believe. And so I believe the estimate was that they were going to have to count about 25 percent of the votes in the election, and they decided it was easier to do a hand count. So the these mechanisms do eventually say picking a random ballot this many times is too complicated, a hand count will be easier. Uh, can I ask a question about this? Uh, the, in a, the, are these numbers based on a, um, a statewide election or or is, is if it's a 1% race in a state rep race, which obviously would have far less than 61,000 votes, do you just hand count all of them because the, there's only 1,000 votes cast? Oh, great. So actually, you asked this question earlier in an email. I promised myself that I was going to address it when I got to this slide, and then I forgot. So so you'll notice that there's one thing that is conspicuously absent from this uh, slide, and that is notice that the total number of votes cast, the total number of ballots cast in the election doesn't appear on this slide. And it's kind of an interesting fact that um, that the numbers that appear here essentially don't change. Um, at, as a function of the total number of ballots cast in the election. Um, so, so essentially, if the total number of ballots cast in the election was, you know, less than 61,224, and that's what your ballot polling 5% risk audit told you to do, you would always, um, you would always, you know, count, you would always just do a complete hand recount. Um, so there, there's actually, um, um, a shade of deception in what I just said. In situations, I mean, you can get a little bit of savings in smaller elections, um, but those savings are very small. So essentially, you should think of these numbers as kind of independent of the total number of the total number of ballots uh, cast in the election. Uh, by the way, just following up on Gabe's question. You can imagine situations where maybe you're auditing a collection of races and some of them are statewide and some of them are not. And unfortunately, um, that that further complicates things. And so what I mean is if you're auditing, you know, three, um, three races that are all statewide, essentially you can use the same random samples to simultaneously audit all three of those races with a very small change in the number of ballots that you choose. <laughs> But as you would guess, you know, if if one of the races that I am trying to audit is a local is a lo- local race, um, then actually I would need not only to have the um, uh, the number of ballots that you see here drawn from the state, I would also essentially need that number drawn from this more local this more local race. So so you know you sort of. Um, uh, you don't have to quite do the whole thing over. That is, you know, ballots that you selected for the statewide audit that happened to be in a uh, in a Senate district or a congressional district um, could get reused for the audit for that congressional district, but you might have to draw more for that congr- congressional district to get the risk limit down there. Well, Alex. Yes, please. Lou, Lou DeCilio again. Um, 
this is the audits themselves. We're just talking about the random audits that the Secretary of State randomly selects. We're not talking about re canvas of the vote, right? I mean, we're talking because like a, a re canvas is anything, we have one half of 1% of the total vote cast or 21 votes or less. And as you said, local races can be decided by one vote, five votes, 10 votes. So when you're talking about auditing and just checking the machines for accuracy, you're not throwing in the re canvas of the votes of any election that would fall under that parameter, uh, just to be clear on this, because I think if you did that, it would totally cause uh, people to question the integrity of the elections if we're not going to count all the votes in a three or five vote race. I, I, yes, I, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the auditing infrastructure is meant in some sense to be independent of the recanvas uh, infrastructure. And, and actually um, for that reason, I mean, when Ben and I have been, you know, talking about uh, trying to weigh these trade-offs of, you know, the mar margin versus how many ballots you choose, we typically stop having these discussions below 0.5% because, you know, uh, for, the, for exactly the reason that you said, you know, there this re-canvas kicks in and to a certain extent, this statistical auditing that we're talking about is, is less relevant because you're gonna do a re-canvas. Um, if I could just jump in for a second, there's obviously policy decisions to be made there, but I think that, I believe that every time I've talked to someone about this, they, they the way to imagine it is, uh, the way we do it now, where the recounts, the recounted races are not included in, in the pool of audits. Uh, you know, obviously that's not a that's n that's not an A to B progression, but uh, but it's a way to think about it at least for now. Yeah, I have a question. Um, this is Lois. Yeah, my question is uh, how. I know it's not a big secret that the Secretary of State has been looking into new, um, getting new tabulators and getting new equipment. Um, the functionality that's required for the ballot comparison in order to create the CVR, um, is, is that, uh, I mean, I guess we're talking to the Secretary of State representative here, um, is, is that being considered in the new equipment? Uh, we, are, we are far away from that, uh, but, uh, yeah, that's that's the type of thing that would definitely be considered um, oh yeah, among, you know, uh, maybe a thousand other concerns, uh, all kind of pegged to the future. Um, but yes, for sure, that would be something that, you know, when we get there, that would be something that would be a, under consideration. Okay. I, I had one, I had one uh, last uh, slide and um, then I'll give the, oh, actually, it's, it's actually four o'clock, isn't it? Um, in any case, um, in the voting lab, uh, oh, sorry, that's not what I wanted. Okay, so just to conclude, so some options that we may consider, um, and this isn't meant to be exhaustive, but some things that we might consider uh, for piloting in November, 2021, um, would be to try to run pilots of both polling and comparison. Um, both of these methods, and I, I didn't um, emphasize this when I was talking about comparison, both of these methods really require ballot manifests. Um, this is this like post-election sort of high precision accounting for the number of cast ballots at, e at each polling location. And so, you know, I, I think one question that would be nice to address in these pilots is how time consuming that is and what procedures can be for those that um, help make them accurate and, and, and help keep the, um, you know, help keep the number of man hours down. Um, I, I would personally like to see us um, pilot a comparison audit. And in that case, uh, I think the natural thing to do would be to use the state's existing audit station, which can produce CVRs which are an integral part of the comparison audit. Um, I mentioned this, which is that a comparison audit requires a way to identify individual ballots. The way we've been talking about doing this in the voter lab is to place small QR stickers on the ballots, but there may be other proposals for that. 
Um, and at the end of the day, we'd sort of like to evaluate the time commitment and the accuracy of this manifest creation of polling and of uh, CVR uh, creation and, and ballot comparison. Okay, um, let me let me stop there, um, and I'll get the floor back to you, Gabe. Sorry for burning up the whole hour here. No, do not apologize for having an interesting presentation. Um, that's that that was that was great, and it was great for uh, speaking on behalf of the non-math folks. That was great for the uh, for 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 my just general understanding of this. Um, so the next thing on our uh, agenda is to just come up with a, a a little bit of a timeline on how we proceed. Uh, we obviously have a very uh, it's a it's a very tight. Um, it's going to be a very tight timeline to have a pilot program for this November and then report to the legislature before their next legislative session, which is what the statute that created this working group requires. So we're, we're obviously not going to have, um, you know, a thousand meetings uh, because there's not time to do that. Um, so I, I will I, we're going to I think we'll meet again at the beginning of October um, and I will send a um, I'll send a query around to make to try and get, you know, as many people as we can to one meeting. Um, and then uh, at that meeting, we'll talk about setting the towns that will participate. Uh, according to the statute, it's between five and 10. And I believe that our office has already started to reach out to people and we will obviously accelerate that. Um, uh, we'll, we'll make a final determination of, of you know, which methods, uh, and it sounds like Alex has a plan for both, which is great, um, which methods of, of risk limiting audits we can, we can pilot and what those pilot programs will look like, um, and obviously when we go to when we go to try and figure out the towns, it would be great to get a variety of sizes so that we're not doing all of these pilots in you know towns the size of Union, Connecticut, and we're also not doing all of these pilots in towns the size of Bridgeport, right? So there, it, we we would need a little bit of both, um, and then uh, also identify and you know Alex has obviously done some of that, but identify the uh, any needs that are currently not in place that we would need to get in place. Uh, in time for November, so that we can have a um, to have a successful pilot. Um, so, uh, does anyone have anything to add to that for uh, for what they think the next meeting should um, should have? Yeah, excuse me, Gabe. Trying to find my mute button. Yeah, um, sure. A couple of quick questions. One, who who actually conducts these audits? And what is the what what do you need from the members of this uh, committee? You know, what can what can our contribution be? Well, uh, so in terms of who conducts the audits, I, it, the audits have always been conducted by uh, uh, the local election officials. Um, oh. And 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 if any of the registrars would like to hop in here, because it's you that do it, um, so uh, you know, feel free. Um, but so the so so that's who would conduct these audits uh, as far as. Uh, what the working group can do. Um, we all need input. Uh, obviously, the Yukon Voter Center is going to take kind of, they've been thinking about how to do this for years. So they're going to take the lead in kind of designing um, the pilot. But uh, but everyone on this committee was appointed because they have insight into, into how, uh, how this can and, and should be done. Uh, and I think that we should expect to rely heavily on the expertise of the registrars in terms of what's practical. Um, and, 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 you know, obviously practicality is going to be a, a fairly big stumbling block considering that we're talking about something that's going to happen two months from now. Um, uh, and then um, I believe Alex has some supporting materials that we can send around uh, in the next couple of days. Um, and, and we, you know, we're looking for your comments and your thoughts, how to, how to design this, how to design these pilot programs in a way that'll work mm. and that will get meaningful results about whether it makes sense for the state of Connecticut to move forward or how the state of Connecticut could move forward in implementing something like this. Got it. All right, very good. And Alex, are you available if we, if some of us want to take a ride up there to, to spend a little time with you as you go through the, uh, the, uh, the points of design? Oh, absolutely. That, that would be, that would be great. So, um, um, yeah, I'm back on campus. Uh, you, you can't see because um, my Zoom install put me in space, but I'm actually back on the university, uh, back at the university. And if you'd like to drop by and talk about uh, audits and see the lab here, I'd be thrilled. 
Thank you. No, I'll take you up on that. Um, and, and before we adjourn, does anyone have any, any questions at all about this? Um, seeing none, uh, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? I see uh, Lou, um, and do I have a second? I see Giselle. Uh, so uh, all in favor of adjourning? Okay, um, well, we'll consider this meeting adjourned and I will, uh, I'll be in touch via email to schedule the next one and to send around some materials. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Alex.